Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our full year results presentation. I'm Rick Trainer, and I'm joined by Nick Taylor, our FD, and we have a presentation we will run through. But those of you who don't know us, we'll quickly go through this slide with a bit of background. We are a leading professional services consultancy with a differentiated and complementary service offering. 60% of what we do is insolvency, and the vast majority of that is corporate insolvency, both SME and mid-market. We have a network of offices around the country and some offshore locations. In terms of our other services, the other 40%, advisory and transactional services, effectively that's everything which isn't insolvency and they sit across both of our reporting segments. It includes financial advisory, transaction support, funding, valuations, project and development support, asset management and insurance. Overall, 80% of our 23 revenues came from insolvency and defensive activities from a common network of clients and professionals. The highlights of the year, we're very pleased with these results, which were ahead of original expectations. Double digit revenue and profit growth across both divisions, increased insolvency appointments and an enhanced mid-market reputation. Acquisitions in finance broking and property advisory, Organic growth in property, reflecting resilient nature of services, a further improvement in operating margins. We continue to generate substantial free cash flow, funding our dividends and acquisition payments. We've recommended a 9% increase in the dividend for the year, which is the sixth year in a row of increased dividends. The group is in a strong position and confident of a further year of growth. So in summary, a further successful year, continuing to build on our strong track record of growth, having doubled revenues and tripled profits in five years since 2019. I'll now hand over to Nick Taylor to go through the financial and operating review. Okay, thank you, Rick. We start on slide five with the financial highlights. We have revenue growth of 11%, which has come through a combination of organic growth and acquisitions, giving us revenue for the year of 121.8 million. We've improved our operating margin, 17.9% in the year. That's a 1% uplift on the 22 position. That's come from improvement in both divisions. And that's building on our history of margin progression. If you go back to 2019, those margins were 13.3%. So we've made real progress in the last few years of improving the margins of the business. Over the course of the last year, central costs as a percentage of revenue have been maintained at 6.5%. And that's whilst we've invested in our IT and HR capability in the group. Adjusted pre-tax profits up by 16%. That's having absorbed a £300,000 increase in interest costs over the course of the year, giving us adjusted pre-tax of £20.7 million this year. Tax rate nudged up slightly to 21%. That's reflecting the increase in corporation tax rates that came in for the final month of our financial year giving us a growth in EPS of 15% to 10.5p. And with our increase in dividend of 9%, we're doing that whilst increasing our dividend cover to 2.8 times from 2.6 times last year. And our net cash of 3 million is having paid 10.6 million of acquisition payments and 5.4 million of dividends. So on the next two slides, we'll look at performance by our two operating segments, starting with insolvency and advisory. The non-insolvency activities in this division include financial advisory. These are activities that are very closely allied with insolvency, the likes of restructuring, debt advisory and forensics, our newly formed funding business following two acquisitions over the course of the last two years, and our corporate finance team. In terms of the numbers, we've seen revenue growth of 10%, the organic growth of 6%, principally coming from an increase in insolvency activity. And we saw the benefit come through from the mantra acquisition towards the end of the first quarter. Our margins are up to 26.8%, a 1% increase. And that's given us a profit growth of 14% in the year. And you can see the chart on the bottom right of the slide showing the profit growth that we've delivered in this division over the course of the last three years. Looking at the movements in revenue, the revenue from formal insolvency appointments increased to 70.6 million. That increase in insolvency appointments benefited both in-year revenue, which was up by 10%, 
and also our order book, which positions us well going forwards. And that order book number of 35.2 million we're quoting tends to increase as cases progress. So as we realise more assets or we're successful in litigation, there'll be more value in the case, more value to creditors, and our fees will also increase. The prior year performance was enhanced by an exceptionally high level of personal insolvency activity, which gave a pretty tough comparative for financial year 22, where there was an extra 1.8 million of revenue in that year. What we've seen this year is personal insolvency normalized to five and a half million. So that's about 8% of revenue. And it's typically been under 10% of insolvency fees across the years. With an advisory, our revenue increased by 4.4 million to 19.1 million. That's a record level of revenues from advisory within this division. That's 20% of divisional revenue. And that was principally driven by the acquisition of Mantra. A reminder, that's an FCA regulated finance and insurance brokerage, which has performed well in the year and in line with expectations. And our headcount in this division at the end of the year is up to 664 from 590. If we move on to property advisory and transactional services, this is our chartered surveyors practice. Revenue growth of 12%, principally driven by acquisitions, both acquisitions in year and the full year impact of last year's deals. And we've also seen 3% organic growth, which reflects our resilient service lines in what's been a pretty challenging marketplace over the course of the last year. Margins up in this division as well to 18% from 16.8% last year. And that's given a profit increase of 19%. And as you can see from the chart at the top in this division as well, we've made good profit progression over the last three years. So looking in a bit more detail at the various services we provide in this division, starting with transactions, which accounts for about 35% of the revenue, we've had a good year. Our mix of activities and clients has proved resilient against the many headwinds that have been around the marketplace. Within auctions, we saw an increase in activity, and that's principally driven through insolvency-related sales of plant and machinery and other assets, which more than offset the decrease we saw in property sales in the first half. We've invested in our property auction team, did an acquisition in the second half, a team from Mark Jenkinson & Co., which is a Sheffield auctioneers, which complements our existing team, which is very much based across Manchester and Leeds, and increases our coverage down into South Yorkshire. And you would typically expect in the current economic cycle that we'd see more properties sold through auction. So we should see this team getting busier over the course of the next couple of years. Our commercial properties team increased from acquisitions and organic growth. The adverse impact of the mini budget, which saw quite a lot of transactions stall in the autumn. So those pick up and come back through over the course of the second half. And our client mix, which tends to be SMEs, independent landlords, property sizes, which are relatively small. So capital value is up to two and a half million. And the fact that half of our agency fees come from lettings does tend to mitigate the market volatility that you would see elsewhere for agency services. And within business sales, which is our state agency for small businesses, transaction levels were robust. And we saw that absorbing the market impact of higher interest rates. Our projects and development team, which is about 25% of income, a range of consulting services in here, which includes project management, building surveying, transport planning. We saw continued growth in the building consultancy work we do from the public sector, principally relating to schools. And over the course of the last year, we've seen an increased focus on sustainability projects. Moving to the right-hand side of the slide, valuations, about 25% of income. This is typically valuing assets for lenders but we also do valuations for insolvency purposes and where loans are challenged or in some distress. The revenue increased over the course of the year, resulting from the full year impact of the acquisition we did towards the back end of last year. On an organic basis, performance has been robust despite the short-term disruption that we saw following the mini budget when lots of transactions just froze. But what we have seen pleasingly is activity levels return to normal in spite of the further rate rises we've seen over the course of the second half. And the final area of asset management and insurance, which is about 15%, we've seen insurance and property protection increase over the year because of increased insolvency workflow. And our commercial property management team, these tend to be long-term contractual relationships. So organic income pretty much in line with the prior year, 
and we have increased the number of properties that we have under management following acquisitions. And at the year end, we've got 345 people working in this division, up from 326. Move to the next slide, looking at the cash flow. The group remains in a strong financial position. We generate a significant levels of free cash flow. And if we look at the free cash flow net of dividends and prior year earnouts, which was just over 3 million in this year, just over 4 million last year. And that provides us funding for in-year acquisitions. And that's combined with the liquidity that we have within our bank facilities, which can fund larger acquisition opportunities. The reminder of those is a 25 million RCF. There's a 5 million growth line on top. And we extended those facilities in the year through to August 25. And final slide on numbers on slide nine. We're confident of our outlook of delivering a further year of growth in line with the current market expectations. Over the course of the next year, we'd expect cost increases from both inflation and continuing investment in the business to be offset by revenue growth, uh, meaning we'd like to see margins maintained over the course of the next year. With an insolvency, we're well placed to continue growing that service line. The benefit from insolvency appointments that we've taken recently, together with an increase in the order book, and also an anticipation of growth within the mid-market, so that's including the administrations. With our advisory and transactional teams, they have multiple organic and acquired growth opportunities, and we completed the acquisition of Banks Long at the start of the financial year in May. That's a two and a half million revenue chartered surveyors practice. And with our cash generation, strong balance sheet, and facility headroom, We've got plenty of ability to invest further in acquisitions and organic growth initiatives, and we will do an update at the AGM in September 23. So it's been another good year, good set of numbers, and I'll hand back to Rick. Thank you, Nick. Right, moving on now, we're going to look at the insolvency market and look at the opportunities for growing our business across all service lines. Slide 11. UK insolvencies continue to increase. We're now in a higher level of insolvencies than we were pre-pandemic, as you can see from the top chart on that particular slide. Insolvencies, as you may be aware, dipped down during the pandemic and have now increased to a level which, as I say, is above the 2019 level. A lot of that increase is in the smaller cases, liquidations. The larger cases, which are typically done as administrations and are the larger, more complex insolvencies, Still below pre-pandemic levels. If you look at the chart on the right at the bottom, you can see the current run rate of 1,300, above the low of 2021, but still below pre-pandemic levels, but is rising. And also for comparison there, there's the peak in 2008, which shows the level of administrations at that time. And it's worth bearing in mind also that at that time, that peak was probably kept down by low interest rates and bank forbearance. So it could well have been a higher number. So we anticipate that administrations will increase over the course of this year and next year. We will see levels getting back to pre-pandemic levels and above. Overall, we've increased our insolvency practitioner capacity to 93 at the moment from 55 in the last recession. So we have a lot more capacity to cope with this level of work as and when it comes. Moving on to the next slide, just a quick look at the market in terms of who does what. We're very pleased to say that overall, we have the largest share of the market by volume with 13%. And in terms of administrations, those more complex assignments, we now have an 11% share, which is an improvement from fourth place over the last five years. So very much come up on the rails, and that's a much more important part of our business overall. In terms of who does what, the very largest jobs are done by the big four and ex-big four players and a number of American-based boutiques which have an international footprint. In terms of mid-market, it's the national accountancy firms like Grant Thornton, BDO, RSM, ourselves and a number of other specialist players. And then the local boutiques deal with some 70% by volume of the market, so still very fragmented at the lower end which gives us the opportunity to continue to grow our business and take market share. Moving on to slide 13, looking at our own performance over the last year in insolvency, significant growth and well-placed as market leader. Insolvency revenues have doubled to 71 million since 2019, compared with market volumes up to 37%. We have an extensive network of over 4,000 professionals and institutions that refer work into us. 
and half of those refer work on a regular basis. That well-established route to market is 70% of work generated from recurring work providers. 10% comes from digital marketing and the balance is new sources of work and one-off assignments. Income has grown across all case sizes. The larger, more complex appointments represents over 50% of our revenue now. We have an increased reputation for mid-market insolvency and that follows very much the acquisitions we did in 2021 of the two sizable London-based insolvency boutiques, which gives us a significant London presence now. There's plenty of room for growth there. As we've seen, administrations are at a low level still and are rising and are likely to rise significantly over the next 18 months. In terms of our regional network and digital marketing expertise, that provides the volume of cases and the scope to increase our market share there. We've commenced a project with one of the major banks to look at recovering bounce back loans on insolvencies, where it appears that those loans have been inappropriately used. If that pilot proves successful, then there's a significant additional flow of work which should come from that particular source. In terms of administrations over the year, the larger ones with some profile, Paper Chase, of course, most people will have heard of, Avonside Group in the construction arena, Worcester Warriors in sports and leisure, and Cox and & Cox, an online furniture retailer. All sizable jobs which were commenced during the year and will run into next year and some of them beyond that. Moving on to the next slide. Advisory and transactional services now represent 40% of our revenue. So that includes all of the property services and those non-insolvency services across both of our operating divisions. This has been developed from standing start in 2014 with the Edison's acquisition. And we've doubled revenue since 2019 to 51 million. It's a balanced mix of services across both operating divisions, giving counter cyclical, defensive, and pro cyclical services. 75% of income is derived from recurring sources, established clients, that's corporates and investors, banks and public sector panels, fellow professionals, and institutions. Our increased scale enhances the opportunities for cross-selling between our various services, an example of which is that we've seen over £3 million worth of property and property insurance-related services sold within the group to different clients. There are growth opportunities in all of our service lines, both organic growth and the ability to acquire businesses in fragmented marketplaces. And overall, that's giving us the ability to add scale and increase margins. Moving on to slide 15, this is an example of a case study where a number of our service lines have come together. This was a large, ultimately an insolvency case, but it started life as an advisory case, looking at a business which was struggling. We looked at the possibility of restructuring its debts without the need for a formal insolvency and getting additional cash injected into the business. Ultimately, that was not possible. And as a result, we were appointed administrators to freeze the creditor's position and allow us more time to try and sort out the business problems. It was a complex trading company requiring group service lines to deliver the enhanced outcome, including our property services to value a number of properties and also to look at the opportunities for enhancing the value of those properties, particularly if there wasn't a going concern sale. Our property security and insurance teams were involved to make sure the property was secure, well insured and we could keep operating. Our debt collection teams assisted in the book debt collection for the trading business. And our forensic team are investigating the prior insolvency periods to ensure that all assets have been identified to maximize realizations. So ultimately, overall, a successful outcome for all stakeholders. A going concern was maintained. The business was bought by new owners in the new corporate. There was a significant return to secure creditors and preferential creditors, predominantly HMRC on the preferential creditor side, and total group fees of over two million pounds. And most mid-market jobs we get involved with will include a number of different service lines. Almost invariably, property will be involved, but some of the other service lines like forensic also. And indeed, on some of the smaller cases, property services such as the valuation and disposal of punter machinery is involved in the vast majority of our cases. Moving on to slide 16. Looking here at, again, the interaction of various services that we now offer and who of our client base actually takes those on board. As we've seen in the first bullet point here, that in terms of insolvency expertise, various different sectors can come into play and enhance the outcome for stakeholders. 
but looking at our various individual sources of work, financial services, we do lots with banks, insolvency and recovery, of course, but also business and lending reviews, valuations, project consultancy. And this is complemented by the funding placed through brokerages. So the brokerage we now have on board are on the broker referral panels for the bank and we pass work to them. Uh, approximately 800 million pounds worth of work was passed in the last year. And that means it's a very good two-way working relationship with banks, which means that we can generate more work from them as well as giving work to them. In terms of property owners, they use our funding expertise, asset management and insurance, building consultancy, acquisition and disposal, and lettings. And for corporates, insolvency and restructuring advice, funding and debt advisory, M&A, property and insurance. All our services are operating from a common IT platform. Many operate from the same offices. There's a group-wide support team, including regulated compliance and a shared network of clients and introducers. So there's an integration between our services, both in terms of back offices and also in terms of our route to market. Looking at strategy. A proven growth strategy enhancing shareholder value. We intend to do more of the same. It's been very successful for us over the last five years, as we've said. So in terms of organic growth, retention and development of our existing partners and employees, extremely important. Recruitment of new talent. Enhanced cross-selling of our service lines and expertise to a wider client base, as we've discussed. An investment in technology and process to enhance working practices and improve the services to our clients. In terms of our acquisition strategy, we're looking for value accretive acquisitions in any of the following segments, insolvency to increase our market share, advisory and transactional services to enhance expertise and geographical coverage, and complementary professional services businesses to continue the development of the group and its service offering. Acquisitions accelerating growth. As we can see from this chart, that doubling of turnover from 60 million to 22, approximately 60% of that came from acquired growth and approximately 40% from organic growth. We're well established in terms of the process we have for identifying, valuing and acquiring businesses and most importantly, then integrating them into our business, sharing that common platform and working with our existing colleagues. We've made 12 value enhancing acquisitions over this period, delivering revenue and operating synergies. Cash generation, strong balance sheet and facility headroom underpin this capacity for further acquisitions. We anticipate more of the same happening in this current year and beyond. Moving on to the next slide, we can see here our five-year record, 26% annual increase in average growth rate, moving from 60 million to over 120 million of turnover, adjusted profit from 7 million to just under 21 million, increasing the adjusted basic earnings per share from 4.8 to 10.5, and a 10% cumulative increase in the dividend to 3.8p for the year that's just gone. Over that time, the share price has also doubled, and we're looking to continue this overall track record moving forward. So to summarise, We've got a strong platform to continue delivering our strategy of organic and acquired growth, given the increased scale of the group and a broadened base of expertise and enhanced client base and professional referral network. We're well positioned in the current macroeconomic climate with 80% of our income from counter cyclical and defensive activities. Significant financial capacity to deliver our strategy with organic growth opportunities across the group and a good pipeline of acquisition opportunities across fragmented marketplaces. We're confident of delivering current market expectations for future growth. And just to summarize, ultimately, we're extremely pleased with the year's performance and we're looking forward to more of the same moving forward. And if there are any questions in the room, we're happy to take those first and then other questions from those listening in. So, hey guys, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, a few questions for me, please. Uh, firstly, on near term M and A, is there any sense of where that's more likely to be? Is that on the property side? Um, well, it's it's across the board. So we're looking at actively looking at um, opportunities in insolvency, or they 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 will only be small uh, because that is the nature of the uh, the fragmented marketplace now. On property, um, it could be small, or there are opportunities for some some more medium sized acquisitions. It's a much much bigger marketplace, and there's lots more to go out there. And we're also actually looking at our other existing service lines where we think there's uh, M&A opportunities. 
Cool. And then on the, the five-year view, I think you said acquisitions for 60 percent of growth. Yes. Do you think that's how the trend will be in the next five years? Is that how you sort of see things? I think it's likely it will be, yes. And then finally on the, the bounce back loan opportunity, can you give a sense of how that's progressing? I think one of your listed funding players mentions it now and again. So is that do you get a sense? Is this the year you'll know if that's a bigger opportunity or uh, yes, I think so. Yes, yeah. It's it's early days with that. We are starting to see some success. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think by the end of this year, hopefully by the end of this calendar year, we'll be able to assess whether it's something that really the banks will want to push, both in terms of the existing bank we're working with and other banks will see that as an opportunity to get a better recovery. And is your fee from that attractive, essentially? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we've, we've, we've in that particular instance, we've agreed a, a minimum fee per case. And then obviously there's a share of any success that would be in actually achieving recoveries. Just to follow up one on the MA point. So you're coming about the insolvency market, only kind of small opportunities there now. So you're not seeing those slightly bigger opportunities like CBR, DR, DRP. Are they, are they kind of not available in the market anymore? What um, has changed there? Well, well, there were relatively few of them. So they were uh, pretty uncommon. And they've almost all gone now. There are there are one or two, but at the moment they're they're firmly uh, remaining independent, despite having been approached by us and no doubt one or two other people, I suspect. Yeah. Um, but it is literally one or two, mm-hmm. and below that it's a fairly significant jump down to there's probably a few businesses which are up to five million turnover, mm-hmm. but the vast majority will be one and two million turnover businesses. Thank you. And the other one was on retention. How, how easy or difficult are you finding that? Is that one of the kind of key things to think about with respect to wage inflation? Yes, it's very important. Um, in terms of senior people, I'm pleased to say we've, we've been very um, successful in re- retaining senior people. We're definitely seeing more movement now in typically two or three years experienced uh, junior members of staff. The insolvency profession, which has been quiet for some time, is starting to gear up again for obvious reasons. And that means uh, junior staff with some experience are hot property. I just wonder when you think about your uh, M&A outlook, how you think about um, debt versus equity, particularly given what's happened to um, rates and the cost you're, you're, you're paying for debt, how you think about that. And then I just wanted to explore a little bit the, the margin improvement, so very healthy margin improvement year on year, 22 to 23. You're signaling, kind of maintaining the margin this year. So, what are the um, what are the various sort of pushes and pulls on that? Okay. Well, if we start with um, how how we fund M and A, clearly we have a significant facility which is unused at the moment. Um, it's obviously become more expensive to use as interest rates have gone up. Um, we certainly would want to keep a significant element of that available for working capital if insolvencies rise um, rapidly. Uh, but equally, uh, we're comfortable using some of that for, for our M&A, in addition to the cash that we're naturally generating in the business, which will go towards um, our M&A acqu- acquisitions. If there are any sizable um, uh, opportunities, it may well be that we look at some sort of mixture of using our debt facilities and equity raise. But at the moment, given what we're looking at over the, sh- over the short term, uh, we feel very comfortable our cash generation and available facilities will cover any uh, of the, the M&A that's likely to happen over the course of certainly between now and Christmas and probably now the end of the financial year. And in terms of the margin question, Nick, do you want to uh, deal with that? Yeah, so the, if, you, if you look back at where the margin enhancements come over over a period, it's come from partly leveraging sort of the group's fixed costs. So as as the top line has grown, the finance, IT, HR teams haven't grown proportionately with that. So that's been a big driver. That's flattened out over the course of the last year because we put a bit of investment in and scaled those teams up. When you look at the segmental margin, uh, insolvency has grown pretty much year on year over the course of the last few years. And that's really just as we've been growing the top line, a lot of the fixed costs in the division haven't grown with it. And similarly within, within property, as we've been adding, so the property cost, the sort of the fixed real estate costs of operating the business and things have stayed where they are. I think as we look forwards over the course of the next year, because of the combination of salary inflation that we'll see in the new year, 
and also some organic investments where we're bringing new people in and there's clearly a level there's a period of time where they need to settle in and deliver their return then we'd expect that the margins will probably be pretty flat over the course of the next 12 months so we've got a question from Peter Renton at Sencos. How do you see your market share in volume of administrations progressing over the coming years? Do you expect to reach the number one position? And if so, what gives you the confidence in reaching that milestone? And if not, why not? Well, we haven't set a goal to be number one in administrations. I think that certainly we will increase the number that we do and we'd like to think we'll increase our market share. Um, there are other people who are very active in that marketplace and very successful at it. Uh, and we'll be happy if overall we, we do improve our share, but we improve the, increase the absolute number that we get. But also we increase the volume side of the business as well. And um, we've got a question from Andy Edman from Equity Development. Just uh, a couple of questions uh, from me. Um, maybe for you, Rick, first, uh, just on the environment for uh, for acquisitions as you've just been talking about they're probably more likely to be smaller bolt on perhaps you know mama papa family family groups do, do you think the the current uh, difficult climate is um, a positive or a negative uh, for you to pick up uh, businesses that fit in with your strategic ambitions in that perhaps people might want to hold off for better times to get top dollar, or they may be realising that uh, being part of a larger group and the cross-selling opportunities is a, a better safe haven. Yeah, well, I suspect, Andy, both of those are true. There will be businesses who will look at it and say, now is not the right time. And there will be others who think that uh, getting something now, and as you say, the, the safe haven of, uh, of being part of a lot larger organisation and no longer taking the risk of running a business means it's time to do something. And if we can structure our acquisitions that we have in the past, where there's a strong element of the consideration, which is based on earn out over a prolonged period of time, that can often give the confidence, even for those businesses which think maybe now isn't the right time, that actually if they have confidence in their market returning, they'll see the, the value in the deal come through to them in due course. And uh, Nick, um, just interested um, in what you're saying about this property transaction market and uh, the, the the problems um, in in the, the rate crisis, or now in the rearview mirror uh, with uh, with Truss's mini budget. Um, but of course, now rates are materially higher, and it's not your market, but mortgage rates are up at a sort of fourteen, fifteen year high um short-term gilts are well above the, the yield levels that were reached um last autumn so right at the moment there's clearly been a recovery but you, you're still reasonably happy with what you're seeing in the the transaction and the advisory side of property yeah i think i think we're happy we're obviously cautious about what might happen going forwards but I mean, it's the point I made on my slide, Andy, that the, the average value of properties that we're dealing with is relatively modest compared to what some of our larger competitors would be dealing with. And very often it's a commercial unit that's being used for business purposes that's being acquired. So the, that, that actual increase in finance cost is relatively modest compared to what they're using the business for and the returns they're going to get from it. Now, you might have answered George Devereux from Hanover Investors question, which is how sensitive is the property segment for slowdown in commercial real estate? And he goes on to ask, what do you see as the impact on the property segment of what's currently occurring in the commercial real estate, i.e. reduced utilisation, reduced valuations, potential insolvencies? Well, I think, I think that's just a continuation of your of previous answer isn't it? it says yeah what i would just bring out is it it's the mix of things that we do in the in that segment that gives it its resilience so it's managed to grow organically over the course of the last 12 months against some pretty major headwinds the ones that andy was referring to and there's a fair amount of insolvency related work that goes through there so the sales that we do through auction of both property and plant machinery the insurance work that we're doing the valuation work 
a lot of that is distressed, such as the case study that Rick gave where the valuations team would have been involved on that. So there's a there's a very broad range of work that we're doing in there, which, which gives it its resilience, which makes us feel comfortable with it as we look forwards. And a couple of questions from Jeff Jones, who asks, what are the main factors which determine fees in the insolvency market and how are inflationary costs passed on? And he goes on to ask, please, could you comment on the productivity and other benefits from IT investment? Does this tend to use bespoke software or software that's available to smaller competitors? To answer the first question in terms of uh, how do we charge for insolvencies? Um, we charge predominantly on a time basis. Uh, on smaller cases, we are limited by the realizations of the assets because that's ultimately how we're paid and the asset realizations. On larger cases, it is very much based on time and agreeing those costs overall with either typically the banks on the larger cases or the body of creditors on smaller cases. In terms of uh, being able to uh, increase those uh, those charge out rates and pass our cost increases internally on to our customers, there is some opportunity on the larger cases. On the smaller cases where it's effectively a fixed fee, it is all about that trying to work more efficiently, which is um, the second part of the question. Uh, there is very limited uh, bespoke software available to uh, the insolvency profession because it's so small, it's not really in the interests of many organizations to uh, invest the time and effort to uh, try and compete for a, a limited market. So we develop some um, opportunities and uh, systems ourselves, sometimes on the back of readily available Microsoft type uh, products, but in-house developing those to make sure they work for us. So they're not things which are readily available to, to everybody. And um, ultimately, we think the investment that we'll make in it will benefit us compared with our competitors. And a question from Gavin Laidlaw from Stockwatch. How bad could things get for the economy? That's a real difficult one. I mean, if you looked on a worst case basis, you would say that uh, the last peak in insolvencies in what was termed the Great Recession was about 26,000. But as I mentioned in the presentation, that was uh, uh, kept down by low interest rates and um, low inflation. Uh, we now have high inflation and increasing interest rates. So we could well see numbers um, go up to a much higher number. They were up to almost 30,000 in the 1990s recession uh, when the population of businesses was significantly smaller than it is now. So we could easily see the numbers go up uh, to the, uh, the high 20s and possibly beyond. Thank you very much. And that's the end of Remote Questions. OK, well, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody both in the room and joining us, dialing in. Um, I'd just like to reiterate, we're very pleased with our year's results and we're looking forward very much to uh, the, the coming year, which we've already made a good start on. Uh, thank you for joining us and I hope you all have a wonderful summer.